Kenneth uh, Browder was accused of stealing a backpack and spent three years in Rikers Island waiting for the trial date. On the three years, two were spent in a cemetery cell. Kenneth Browder becomes an image of the way black Americans are treated by the justice system and police. When Camif was still a baby, his biological mother put him for adoption because of her drug problems. He was raised by his adoptive mother, Benita Browder, and he lived on Prospect Avenue, Bronx, New York. Camif was raised in a loving family and was described as intelligent and funny. In 2009, when he was 16 years old, he was charged with grand larceny after police testified that he had stolen a bakery truck for a joyride and crashed it. Although he pleaded guilty at first, he later claimed that he was just a bystander. He was charged as an adult, registered as a young form offender, and put on probation. On May 15 of 2010, Kamif and a friend were heading home after a party when they were stopped by policemen. He thought the police were, were carrying out the routine stop and frisk. Stop and frisk is a New York City police department practice of temporarily detaining, questioning, and at times searching for weapons and other contraband. Kamif and his friend didn't know that in a nearby patrol car was a boy named Roberto Bautista. Roberto was with the police looking for the two black men he believed had stolen his brother's backpack two weeks earlier. He identified Kamif and his friend as the thieves, and they were both apprehended. Roberto is a Mexican boy, and from what I found, he wasn't really good with English, and it's possible that he didn't fully understand and push to identify them. After 17 hours, Camif was interrogated in, and charged the next day with robbery, grand larceny, and assault. He was charged with second-degree robbery, and his bail was set at $3,000. His family didn't have that kind of money, but when his mother got the money for his bail, Camif was not allowed to be released because he was on probation. Camif was still awaiting a trial when he was sent to Rikers Island, which is no for having an intense culture of violence. Camif said that he suffered countless abuses by the hands of inmates and correctional officers. On September 23 of 2012, a video was recorded showing Camif being assaulted by prison guards while in handcuffs. He made several suicide attempts while in prison, although correctional officers intervened to make sure his attempts were unsuccessful. Camif later said that the correctional officers provoked him to do it. He said in an interview that Quote, prior to going to jail, I never had any mental illness. I never tried to hurt myself. I never tried to kill myself. I never had any thoughts like that. I had stressful times prior to going to jail, but not like do during jail. That was the worst experience that I ever went through in my whole life. In March of 2013, after appearing before eight judges, the judge Patricia Di Mango offered an immediate, immediate 
remiss in exchange of his admission of guilt to two misdemeanors, with credit for time already served. Camif rejected the deal and was sent back to Rikers Island. In May of 2013, the judge Patricia Di Mango ordered the remiss of Camif in anticipation of the dismissal of the charges against him. Roberto Bautista had returned to Mexico and could not give testimony against Brother. After Camif remiss, he passed the GED, General Educational Development Examination, and later enrolled at the Bronx Community College. After Camif remiss, he passed the GED, General Educational Development Examination, and later enrolled at the Bronx Community College. He also joined the Future Now program that offers a college education to previously incarcerated youth. In May of 2015, he received an A grade for a paper titled A Commoser Mook at Cemetery Confinement in the United States. What Cemetery Confinement should be invoked at as a wall around the United States and even through changes toward the Cemetery Confinement system have begun in some states. More needs to be done and addressed around the country. In a lot of jails and prisons, there are a lot of moving circumstances in practice that go on within that are not addressed that people need to shed light on, like cemetery confinement, for example. Maybe another form of punishment or segregation should be implemented to deal with inmates who break jail rules as opposed to inmates who cause severe harm to other inmates and to correctional officers because the mental health risk it poses are too great. Camif worked as a tutor in mathematics for the GED as a security guard and also handed out flyers near near Walk Street. He said, Camif filed a lawsuit against the police department of New York City, the Bronx District Attorney, and several correctional officers. The suit claims he was falsely arrested, maliciously prosecuted, and denied a speedy trial. In 2014, Camif said in an interview with a New Yorker, People tell me because I have this case against the city, I am all right. But I'm not all right. I mess up. I know that I might see some money from this case, but that's not going to help me mentally. I'm mentally scared right now. That's how I feel. Because there are certain things that change about me. And they may not go back. Before I went to jail, I didn't know about a lot of stuff. And now I'm aware. I am paranoid. In 2015, after turning 22 years old, he hung himself at his mother's home. One year later, his mother died of heart complications. In 2016, President Obama announced the end of cemetery confinement for teenagers in federal facilities. Obama wrote for the Washington Post in 2013, Camif was remiss, having never stood trial. He completed a successful semester at the Bronx Community College, but life was a constant struggle to recover. 
from the trauma of being locked up alone for 23 hours a day. One Saturday, he committed suicide at home. He was just 22 years old. In January 2019, New York City settled a civil lawsuit with a broader family for $3.3 million. Nobody from the Bronx DA office was held accountable for keeping Camille incarcerated for three years without a trial or a conviction. In October of 2019, the New York Council voted to close down Varkas Island by 2026. I searched for the numbers about wrongful convictions and I found that between 1989 and 2019, the national... In January 2019, New York City settled a civil lawsuit with a broader family for $3.3 million. Nobody from the Bronx DA office was held accountable for keeping Camille incarcerated for three years without a trial or a conviction. In October of 2019, the New York Council voted to close down Varkas Island by 2026. I searched for the numbers about wrongful convictions and I found that between 1989 in 2019, the National Registry Exonerations registered 2,400 exonerations, roughly 80% of which were for serious offenses, according to the report. Of the 2,493 innocent individuals were sentenced to death and then exonerated before being killed. I also discovered that while black defendants were marginally more likely than white defendants to be victims of misconduct, 57% to 52%, the racial gap was substantially bigger for drug offenses 47 to 22 percent in murder cases, 78 to 64 percent. This is everything for today's case. And if you want to know more about this story, go to Camille Brother Foundation and donate if you can. You can find in the show notes the link to Camille Brother Foundation and the international hotlines to everyone that is struggling with suicide thoughts.